to Stories of Scotland. I'm Jenny. And I'm Annie. And this episode is the final interview in the series we made speaking to my grandparents. And it has been a whirlwind. From their childhood accounts of the Second World War to their dancehall romance, this has been a nostalgic trip, Annie. But in this final episode, we're going to look at a very prohibited but culturally fascinating behaviour. Yes, so I'm giving this episode the precursor that we would never encourage anyone to do anything illegal or to break any laws. Yeah, you better be staying inside and washing your hands loads, <laughs> you rascals. So the reason I say this is because we're going to be talking about salmon poaching, which my grandfather spoke about very fondly. And it's going to be a lovely bridge for our next season because we're really delighted to be looking at... Coasts and Waters! From coastal castles to ocean mythology, we're going to be bringing you the best stories from Scotland's rivers, lochs and seas. Yes, but in this episode, we'll blather about poaching. Poaching! We've got my papa's memories of poaching in Dumfries, and then I fished up some really intriguing <laughs> accounts of fishing on the River Tay. We've got a Victorian railway guard detective with a very dark imagination, a tragic fight on the river between river police and poachers, the ends and fatalities. And we've got a story of a village coming together late one night to get the river police totally drunk. Hey! But first, Jenny, what is poaching? Poaching is the hunting or fishing of a wild animal without a license to do so. Uh, decades ago in Scotland, it tended to be done by the local people who would take one for the pot. So they would be catching animals or fish that they would then eat themselves. However, nowadays, poaching is a really damaging crime and poachers can often have a very negative effect on the ecology of an area. Yes, so the rights for freshwater salmon in Scotland are privately owned. Fishing for any freshwater fish in Scotland without a licence is a civil offence. But for salmon and trout, it's even more illegal. It becomes a criminal offence. Well, your papa certainly had his own set of rules for this, Annie. That he did. Shall we dive in and find out? Oh, you've got me hooked. <laughs> what a splash. Okay, play your granddad. <laughs> <laughs> Could you tell me if you've ever been poaching? Poach? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we used to do a little bit of poaching, but not up here. I'm not, I'm not poached when I come up to Codder. Because, well, you're in Codder Estate, you couldn't very well uh, poach on the lair's grid. <laughs> so, down in Dumfries. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I used to take mere salmon out of the water. We never ate, we never ate them. I mean, your granny and me, I've seen a bath full of salmon. We used to just give them off. You just did it for the thrill of day. And it's... <laughs> can you tell, so can you describe to me what it was like? Did you go at night time? It was at night we went, oh, oh it was dark. In the winter time, then we used to go with a, to a good strong torch and a gaff. I used to make the gaffs in the smithy. What's a gaff? That's what you used to hook the fish out with a gaff. Okay. You had a, again, it was just a bent bit of metal, but it was sharp and it was made out of spring steel. It was hard, you know, mm -hmm. and a wee bar beneath it so that the salmon couldn't get off. And I used to make them in the smithy for different boys, like who would want a gaff made. And he used to go out in the dark. And he would see this. I've seen this. I've seen the salmon not thick in the water. He can. He were in with your big wellies on, and he were walking in amongst the salmon, and he weren't. He were picking what you wanted. There were that many of them. <laughs> can you weren't just seeing a fish and going for it. You were picking the the, the biggest salmon. Wow. No, I, I, that's right enough. The place will still be the same yet, I suppose. And it wasn't a very big burn. The campo. It was a tributary of the River Neth, mm -hmm. and they used to, a lot of the salmon used to go up this compel and for spaining, you know. But you had to get them before they were spaint because they were they were no good once they were spaint the salmon. And um, you kept them in the bathtub. Oh, just till folk came and got collected them. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, they were dead like we killed them. Well, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, so my papa was poaching in Dumfries. However, I found an incredibly dramatic, 
organised salmon poaching crime discovery Ooh. from the Dundee Telegraph in 1887. It talks about how the cunning detective work of a train station guard unstitched a tapestry of salmon-thieving misdemeanours. The article is called... The Snarling Fishers and Salmon Poaching on the Tea. And it's authored by an anonymous correspondent, as they clearly don't want to be known by the Salmon Mafia. Yeah, you certainly don't want that, or else they'll end up with a fish head on their pillow. <laughs> <laughs> a fish head on their pillow? Yeah, like, in the, would they leave a horse head on the pillow? <laughs> they caught father. <laughs> You come today on the day of my daughter's wedding and offer me half a dozen salmon? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, dearie me. So back to history, Jenny. Our article begins by giving us a wee bit of context about poaching culture around the River Tay. Jenny, can you be Dundonian? Um, I've been working on my accent, Annie, and I'm going to roll with it, see how long it lasts, and uh, we're just going to go with that. All right. <clears throat> Let's set sail into Dundee. The rubber police under the energetic superintendent have been making strenuous and special efforts to cope with the evil this year and have succeeded in creating a sort of panic amongst the river population. Not so many years ago, good business was done after the proper season was closed and under a proper terror of the majesty of the law. Many a fine specimen of salmon species was caught in the neighbourhoods of New Bar. They found their way to Edinburgh and other favourable markets booked from adjoining railway stations as vegetables. With sundry cabbage leaves and green kale blades ostentatiously displayed through the interstices of the hampers and baskets or as game, with rabbit tails peeping from between the lids or as fruit with pears or apples, which Newborough boasts a luxuriant supply this season, displayed to the curious who pride beyond the outside of the receptacles. An incident happened but three seasons ago that busts the secret of this mode of transit. OK, so the newspaper is saying that the poachers were using the railways to transport their fish by disguising them under cabbage leaves or other legal fruits and vegetables. One morning in early September, an innocent-looking hamper or two of vegetables were driven up to Colossae Railway Station in the early morning, sometime before the arrival of the first train to Edinburgh. The crates were duly booked and placed to the side to await the arrival of the train. These disguised crates are midway through their journey to be sold at a market, but a canny guard with a vivid and graphic imagination spots something a wee bit unusual. A little time after, however, the station agent's suspicions were aroused by the oozing of blood from the bottom of the hampers and visions of murder with the bare trunk of a human body hacked and hewn by a bloodthirsty assassin arose in the official's mind. The majesty of the law was invoked in the shape of the county constable from a neighbouring hamlet in whose presence and in the presence of the whole railway staff as witness the hamper was solemnly opened with the result of finding, under a thin veneer of cabbages, leeks and greens, a consignment of salmon. Beautifully dramatic there, Jenny. Thank you. <laughs> she, she did incredible hand movements throughout. <laughs> OK, so the local constable and the station guards have uncovered illegal salmon and they've managed to identify them as being illicit tay salmon. But there's something even more fishy to this tale. Last week, the Watchers... That's the river police. ...placed a sparling fleet under a strict espionage and under the suspicion broke open the fishing lodge connected with Jock's Hole Station, finding there about 200 pounds of salmon, of which they seized. Wow, just goes to show that you can only hide so many salmon in Jock's Hole, Annie. Indeed, Jenny. So the Fishery Board is the government body that regulated fishing and they really clamped down on the stolen salmon empire. However, I really love the name Jock's Hole Station. <laughs> so I looked it up and I find it. It's a wee fishing station near Newborough. It's really small, right on the bank of the River Tay. 
Jock's Hall has got this breathtaking view of the Tay estuary, which on a calm day becomes a glorious white mirror that reflects the sky. It looks absolutely infinite, and with the right weather, the landscape of the Tay looks almost dreamlike. On the maps, Jock's Hole is marked as a little fishing lodge, but it doesn't look like it's still a complete building, unfortunately. Yes, in our record of the historic environment, it's described as a single-storey cottage with two cells, and its roof is entirely collapsed with no rafters. So it looks like it's just a ruin now. Ugh, poor Jock's Hole. It's just not what it used to be. It's situated on the Inner Tay Estuary, which is a site of special scientific interest, or triple SI as they call them in my business, and the landscape you're speaking of is a designated site of conservation. The Inner Tay Estuary is the big river mouth that lies between Dundee and Perth. At some points, it's up to 2.5 kilometres wide, so it looks more like a coastline than a riverbank. And my favourite thing about the area are the Phragmite reed beds. These were planted in the 19th century as a way for farmers to protect their land from flooding. The tall reeds stabilise the shore and act as a buffer for flood water. And what started as a practical planting has, over time, developed naturally into the largest contiguous reed bed in the whole UK, covering almost 15 kilometres of the estuary. Yes, and these beautiful tidal wetlands are home to many rare and protected breeding birds. So the royalty of this habitat for this wee area of the Tay, has to be the Marsh Harrier, a stunning bird of prey which makes a very strong V-shape with its wings when it's flying. And there's a few nesting pairs on the Tay estuary. Marsh Harriers have a very subdued palette of feathers, very creamy, browny and black. But they're fabulous because when the Marsh Harrier male is wanting to find a mate... Wow! They do this incredible dive and tumbling dance, almost like they're at a dance hall. And it's so impressive that sometimes the females might join them on the wing, almost locking talons. It's just absolutely spectacular. And then the maybe less majestic birds. (laughs) Oh no, they're majestic in their own way. The jester of the marshland court would have to be the water rail which is a lovely medium-sized shy bird with a gorgeous curved orange beak. And they are amusingly secretive. You very rarely see them, but you can hear them making a silly piglet squealing call to one another. So you never catch them flying about, but you can hear them shouting, Aw, it sounds like there's bog pigs. As happy as a pig in a salt marsh. <laughs> as happy as a water rail in the salt marsh. <laughs> but yeah, the RSPB protect the area and have a huge say in what can and cannot happen there, ensuring that this diverse and flourishing ecosystem remains just that. Yes, so shall we return to Dumfries and hear a little bit about Papa's poaching misdemeanours? Yes, let's get back to Papa. Poaching. Oh. Did you ever poach salmon for a special occasion? Oh, yeah, you poached them. Okay, so what was Eddie Patterson's special occasion? Well, he came to me when I was working for him, and he says to me, he says, "Hey, Jimmy, he says, I speak to some of the boys, and they tell me it's you're quite handy at getting a salmon out the water." I says, "Oh, no bother." He says, "I could do with salmon then." He says, "My daughter's getting married," and he says. I could. I'd like to put a salmon on the on the menu for her. I says, "Oh, I'll get you a salmon." I went that night and I got half a dozen salmon and gave it to me Eddie Patterson. And Christy would have done anything for me after that. <laughs> you can. He, he says, "No, Jimmy." He says he was delighted at getting all these salmon, and uh-huh. and I mean, they were, it meant nothing to me the salmon. Uh-huh. Again, I wasn't interested in them. But anyway, he, he says, "If there's anything I can do to help you when you're starting up in business yourself." He says, don't be fear to ask. I says, I'll tell you what I've, I've noticed, Eddie. I says, I don't know what you think of it like. But I said, I says, that's your scrap people over there, eh? He says, oh, aye. He says, just a lot of rubbish. I says, I'll tell you what, there's a boring machine there and the power hacksaw. 
I says, I wouldn't mind taking them and uh, getting them working for when I'm in business. He says, just take whatever you want to there. He says, just help yourself. All for some salmon. Uh-huh. Lovely, there you go. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I got the power hacksaw and I got the bore machine and I had them all the time. I was, in, I was, this, I was in the smithy at Kirkland for about six years and they worked away all that time. Okay, but I didn't, I did sort them up. There was bushes going, okay, and the shafts can you worn. So, but I'd got them all done up and I worked them all the time. Did you ever get caught when you were poaching? No. Everybody poached. The, the water bail was 40 degrees in the water. Mm-hmm. In fact, I, I knew, you know, the water bail is quite well. And he said, Christ, he says, I'm 40 degrees in the water. He says, would you go down with you? <laughs> <laughs> Why was he scared to go down to the water? He said he was feared somebody would bloody put the gaff in him and throw him in the water. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so the water bailey, so that's the, the person who's meant to what, implement keep, fishing licenses. Keep you for fishing. <laughs> and stop people from Poach. poaching. Yeah. Was actually afraid to go to the water. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't blame him. But, I mean, many of the boys that I knew, they were rough. They would have, they would have put them in the water quick, you can, rather than get caught. <laughs> so with the fishes... So they wouldn't, he wouldn't have kept where they were because it was pitch black, it was dark, you can You wouldn't have known unless he's shown the torch in their face, you can But I've seen the comp, the river, the, the, the burn comp, I've seen his going out in the night and you would see nothing but a row of torches going up. They were, they were all, <laughs> <laughs> you weren't just yourself. <laughs> that's great. And that's why the water barely wouldn't have been keen to go. <laughs> He should have joined the poachers. Wouldn't stand a chance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, so how much do you think the world has changed since you were young, younger? Well. Since you're still in your 40s? <laughs> oh, I'm just in my 40s, isn't it? <laughs> it's not that long ago. <laughs> well, I don't think you would get away with things like that. It is the thing that we used to do with. In fact, I don't think anybody would be bothered going out day in it. I mean, there's no money for would going out in the dark in the winter night just to poach a salmon, but we thought nothing about it. That was our life. But uh-huh. I, I can't see if out there and not new. But they might, for all I know. <laughs> but I don't think I would. No. <laughs> Jeez, Addy, your papa was quite the poacher. Yes, he definitely was. But we can tell from how he talks about his antics that he was not alone. It sounds like everyone was a nighttime fisher at one time or another. It did, so much so that the water bailiff himself knew he didn't stand a chance against the horde of poachers. Yes, that poor man was definitely outnumbered. (laughs) It just goes to show how accepted poaching was back then that almost everyone in the area was doing it. It was ingrained in rural life, another way to get by, to feed the family and make some money on the side. And I think it's interesting to look at why fishing was illegal in the first place at all. These rivers run through the land that the people live on. Surely they should be able to catch a fish without the fear of persecution. But although they lived in this land, they did not own it, no, and thus did not own the rivers or the fish in them. Yes, so that was the Laird's land. And the laird would have had the rights to all of the fish on any rivers running through their land. Mm. So if you wanted to fish legally, you had to get a permit and permission from the landowners. And occasionally, landowners would have been strongly disliked by the folk who lived on their land. So by poaching fish or game, the locals were able to sneakily fight against and undermine the ruling elite. And I guess in their eyes, these landowners already had so much. What is a few less fish to them, you know? Plus, if they can feed their families or exchange the fish for other goods, then it's easy to understand why so many people were poaching. Aye, and my papa seemed to enjoy just the sport of it because he doesn't actually like eating fish that much. (laughs) It was just a fun pastime, something to do, and he was really good at it. He himself used some salmon to gain favour with his boss and ultimately ended up trading it for a hacksaw. Yeah, salmon for a hacksaw, the classic deal. Not bad at all. 
and the perfect example of how poaching helped drive the social workings of rural life. From weddings to scrap metal, the stolen salmon meant a lot to these people and was worth breaking the law for. Yes, but nowadays it's a very different story. Back then, the availability and supply of food was very different. Salmon poachers, however, in the 21st century, aren't getting one for the family or a few for a wedding. They use practices that can be really damaging to the water quality and the environment. So Scotland is famed for its top quality salmon, so let's stick to the legal fishes and leave the poaching to history. Fishing is a massively popular sport, and it's a good way to build up your patience. So just get a license or permissions and catch some of the most delicious fishes in the world. And try to do it in the daylight as well. It can be slippery in the dark out there. We find ourselves back on the bonny banks of the River Tay to hear a story of poaching with a truly tragic ending, known as the Battle of Gutter Hole. So there's an introduction to this dreadful poaching accident in a book I found that's about 100 years old. It's called Rivers and Lochs of Scotland by W.L. Calderwood. So Jenny, can you be a person who would write a Scottish loch book? The Gutter Hole is the name of a fishing station and was the scene of the encounter. Gangs of men had for some time been working nets in spite of the watchers, and emboldened by success and with steady addition to their numbers, were beginning to openly defy the river watchers even in daylight. The watchers finding themselves in a powerless minority quickly sought help from Mr Lumsden's force up the river. And one night, two boat crews floated silently down the river. A large body of poachers were discovered with two boats busily at work. Aye, so Gutter Hole was a fishing station just along the coast from Jock's Hole. It sits below a large manor house, Mugdrum House. We think the name Mugdrum comes from the Gaelic meaning a pig's back. This makes sense when you see Mugdrum Island, a wee reedy island poking up from the Tay that looks like bristles on a hog's back. But let's go back to when this ill-fated incident happened, in September 1888. Hot off the press from the Dundee Telegraph. About nine o'clock on Tuesday evening, a serious affray took place between a band of river poachers and watchers at Gutter Hole Fishing Station, in which some of the watchers and poachers were seriously hurt and two lads drowned. Two boats of river police under Superintendent Lumsden observed a number of men and, suspecting that they were there for poaching purposes, one boat's crew was landed. They had instructions to come down on the suspected men under the shrubs and tree of Mugdom grounds. The poachers had scouts to give warnings of the watchers, and a bright light was shone to warn the poachers. A rapid dash was made to their scene of operations, On the alarm bell being raised, the poachers began to make the preparations for flight, but were stopped by the descent of the second boat of police, who sprang over Mugdrum Wall. A regular melee took place between the two bands of police, numbering about a dozen, and the poachers, of whom there were nearly thirty. Sticks and stones were being freely used. The police succeeded in capturing four of their opponents, the remainder making their escape. One of the watchers sustained serious injuries and fell unconscious into the river, where he would have drowned had it not been that, seeing in the darkness an object in the water and supposing it a net, some of the police made to secure it and found the body of a man, Makurach, one of the watchers. Some of the watchers had been more or less seriously injured, and John Simpson, one of the men apprehended, was considerably cut about the head. The most serious part of the occurrence, however, is the disappearance of two young men who were with the poachers at Gutter Hole, and with several others, during the heat of the fight, attempted to wade and swim across to Mugdrum Island. All but two succeeded in the attempt, and these two, who were young lads, have not been seen since. Oh, this is a really dark tale, with the warning lights leading to a brawl on a dark night over salmon. It's just needless violence. What we later discover is that most of the people involved in the poaching that night actually worked in the fishing industry themselves, so they were just trying to make a few extra catches. 
Heartbreakingly though, the story continues because fishing crews were needed for the gruesome job the next day of looking for bodies. From an early hour this morning, several boats' crews have been dragging the River Tay with grapnels from Newborough shore to Mugdrum. At half past ten o'clock, the men in one of the boats pulled up the body of William Spence, one of the missing men who were supposed to have taken part in the affray with the river police on Tuesday night. Spence is about 22 years of age and was employed during this season as a salmon fisher. He was unmarried and resided with his brother. At 11.45, the other body, that of David Henderson, was found in the same spot. He was the son of a quarryman, Robert Henderson. Henderson was only about 18 years of age. The body was bleeding at one of the ears. Both bodies were removed to the town hall of Newborough, where they are awaiting medical examination. This affair has caused a profound sensation in Newborough. It's such a devastating story that when I came across it, I wasn't really sure if we should cover it. Mm. But then I thought, if we didn't talk about it, these lads might never have had their story told. So I tried to find out a wee bit more information about them. William Spence had worked as an agricultural labourer. Both William's parents, who were called William and Isabella, had been deceased at the time of the accident. When they were alive, they were linen weavers. He had an older brother, James, who was a tailor, and another brother, Andrew, and a wee sister named Annie. Mm. David Henderson had a big family who all lived in Newborough and who were from the area. His father had been a salmon fisher and a quarry worker, and his mother, Anne, was deceased. He had three brothers, James, who worked in the quarry too, John and William, and two little sisters, Elizabeth and Betty, the youngest. The street that they lived on was just full of salmon fishers, and it seemed that every man on the census was connected to the salmon industry in some way. And that's all the information I could find out about them. Seems like it was a really tight-knit community of fishers in the area, and so this really would have struck the whole community quite hard. I wonder if it, in the long term, had an effect on the numbers of people who were poaching, or if it carried on as normal. It definitely transformed poaching of Newborough. The Battle of Gutter Hall certainly left a big scar in this close-knit community, and there was significantly less poaching Mm. in the coming years. Uh, It's so sad that two young lads had to die for something to change, but clearly it sounded like the operation was huge and probably a bit out of hand to begin with, so unfortunately this is the sad end to an illegal game, essentially. 